Okay, good afternoon everybody. We're just after 12 o'clock, uh, so we'll uh, we'll start. Welcome to the uh, the Arctic uh, webinar this afternoon, um, which is all about the Bus Open Data Service Trans Exchange Profile. Um, this is uh, the latest in a series of uh, of webinars on data standards that we're holding uh, as Arctic. Um, so um, this afternoon, um, I'll give you a quick introduction to Arctic for those of you that are new to us. Then we'll introduce the Bus Service Act um, and um, a very quick introduction to Trans Exchange before we get into the uh, main meat of this afternoon's webinar, which is all about the uh, Bus Open Data Trans Exchange profile. And we're lucky to have Ben Murray from the Open Data team to uh, to talk to us about that. Um, and then, um, all being well, we should uh, have some uh, time at the end to uh, answer any questions that you've got. And I'm sure that you've got loads about uh, Open Data Profile. So, uh, Artig, for those of you that are new to us, um, we're a uh, trade member organisation for public transport technology stakeholders. Our members are everybody from authorities and government through to bus operators, consultants and software and system suppliers. Um, we carry out a range of different activities, uh, all about uh, encouraging better use of technology in public transport. Um, we hold events like this in more normal times. We do these face to face as full day sessions. Um, we have um, quite an extensive technical library of standards, um, how to do everything from traffic light priority to creating trans exchange to support real time systems. Um, and um, we help people um, with their implementations. Um, working with them to, to understand best practice, make sure things are working um, well. Um, and we work with uh, the DFT and the devolved administrations to help support them produce guidance and advice on how to, to use standards um, and how they should be using and encouraging standards. And we um, work with um, international standards bodies like uh, SEN at a European level, but also um, ENTER in, in Norway and VDV in, in Germany to, to encourage uh, more general use across the wider sector um, around the world. Um, so if you want to know more about Artig, then please get in touch. Um, my details uh, are on the last slide at the end of today. Um, so, um, Bus Open Data um, all comes about through Bus Service Act 2017, um, and so that allows the Secretary of State to uh, legislate to uh, make sure that bus operators open up data for local bus services across England. Um, this is an English only act. Um, there are uh, similar things going on in uh, in Scotland and Wales. Um, operators will have to make routes and timetables, which is uh, routes is the focus of today, really, um, and timetables, fares um, and tickets and real time information from um, the start of this year for routes and timetables. Um, and um, there's uh, some links to, to the legislation itself, but also a useful um, guide to it um, there. These slides, by the way, will be made available along with the recording uh, afterwards. So um, Bus Service Act uh, creates um, new regulations for bus open data. Um, 
the first stage of which was laid before um, uh, Parliament earlier this year. Um, and that creates a new digital service to support open data publishing um, and um, the consumption of that data um, at a national level. Um, the idea being that with um, open, accurate and timely data, um, more people will be encouraged to travel. It will be easier to find out about um, public transport. So um, that's why you've got routes and timetables, but also the fares um, and location, because it's all very well knowing that a bus might go from A to B, but the big question always is, how much is it going to cost? And um, is it coming on time? Is there any disruption? Um, local bus services in England are in scope, um, as well as the part of journeys that are in England that cross over into Wales or Scotland. Um, the, the Act um, has required the creation of a new um, data standard um, in terms of uh, NetEx for fares. Um, and um, we're going to talk today about um, a, an updated um, standard or profile in particular um, for trans exchange for the um, routes and timetables. Um, and finally, the Act um, cr helps create the, the tools and the software that, that's necessary to make sure that um, everybody is capable of providing um, the data um, necessary for the, uh, for the regulations. So, if you're a very small operator, there's a there's a spreadsheet tool that allows you to create your routes and timetables and works um, going on to to do something similar for for fares. Uh, in terms of time scales, um, the the act went out for consultation back in uh, in 2017. Um, it was laid before Parliament in, in July, the, the secondary legislation to create the, the open data service. But um, since um, 2018, work's been going on leading up to that point to build the open data service, which you can now use. Um, and um, from um, January um, next year, you will be required to provide not just the uh, the routes and timetables, which you can populate now, but also fares and location data, um, AVL data. So um, today is all about trans exchange and the specific part of trans exchange, um, but a bit of background for those of you that are new to trans exchange. Um, it's a um, XML format um, designed to help different computer systems talk to each other and understand public transport information, specifically the routes and the timetables. Um, it's been around for um, quite a long time in terms of computer standards, um, nearly 20 years, um, but it's based on um, European uh, transmodel architecture so it fits in with other standards um, and there's a lot of commonality between things like Siri um, and um, NetEx um, so it doesn't sit in isolation you can use similar data constructs and things like that whether it's a, a route and timetable or uh, the route and timetable parts of, of Siri for, for live data or for fares as well. Um, at the moment, there's multiple versions of trans exchange in use, and that's one of the, the challenges that the open data regulations set out to address um, because they do mandate a particular version, version 2.4, um, along with um, a profile that we're going to hear from Ben about um that that covers the data that you have to provide into uh, into the open data service um, 
Language change is extremely flexible because it's designed to cope with pretty much every scenario might have. Um, but because of that, um, it can be seen as complex um, and there are multiple ways to, to describe um, things like um, when a service is going to run, holidays, how to de describe routes. Um, and this is one of the things that the uh, that the open data profile um, is trying to address, trying to help standardize some of that and remove some of the confusion. Now, I'm going to mute uh, everybody, that's it. Um, so um, it is designed to cope and support um, pretty much everything that you might be able to think you need to do. Um, so Transit Exchange supports everything from um, registering with uh, electronic bus registrations um, to, to VOSA, DVSA, um, and it also supports things like moving timetables between operators to authorities, um, for journey planners and real-time systems and printing timetables, um, as well as services like Traveline, where uh, the regions historically have aggregated the data and provided it to, to Traveline nationally. Um, and it's also um, the standard that's used in the uh, Traveline national data set as well. Um, there's there's an awful lot more that we could go into, into the background of Trans Exchange. Um, we did a webinar um, about six weeks ago now, something like that, on Trans Exchange, covering it in more detail. Um, if you're a member, you've got access to that. If you're not a member of Artig, then get in contact and we can talk about how you can get access to that. Um, but there's also uh, lots of information out on the web. Um, about Trans Exchange because it is open um, and available. Um, so um, there's the stuff um, from the DFT um, on the profile um, out there, but there's also uh, a whole host of other stuff on uh, on government websites as well as um, other sites um, that are supported by suppliers and other governments around the world because. Uh, Trans exchange is used quite heavily in, in places like Australia, um, and so you'll find uh, some useful stuff on some Australian sites as well. It is talking about the same thing in case you stumble across it um, and, uh, and think, uh, is this relevant? So there's lots of stuff out there to help you with the background and things like that. But today we're really um, all about the, uh, the Bus Open Data Trans Exchange profile. And so um, we've got Ben from um, from the BODS team um, that's going to talk to us about that. Um, so I'll uh, I'll just uh, hand over to um, Ben. Uh, so I will make you the presenter, Ben. Thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen. I think that's. I think that yep. looks okay. That look? Yeah, that's good. Make sure I can have a go. Okay, great. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, and um, um, thanks for giving me some time. It's uh, it's important for me to raise as much awareness of, of the profile and, and BODS as possible. So um, I've been looking forward to this. Um, I'll introduce myself briefly and, and then I'll talk through what I'm what I'm going to and talk about here on this deck. So I'm Ben and I'm part of the team supporting the DFT with the Bus Open Data Service. I work in the Business Change team, so I'm looking to drive utilization, trying to get as many operators on the system as possible and also as many consumers utilizing that data as possible as well. Um, so um, as part of that process, I talk to operators and local authorities and also um, suppliers and schedulers to make sure that um, they're all um, enabled to create all the data that needs to be created and that uh, all the industry is uh, is clear on, on how to go ahead and create that data and then publish that data to BODS. Um, so as part of that process, understanding the profile has, has been important. I'm not an expert on it. I'll try and give it 
um, a quick walkthrough here. It's 92 pages long, and I'm going to try and do it in just a few minutes. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but I'll I'll try and focus on some of the talking points that I've had with with some of those that I've been talking to, um, to uh, to try and um, give some insight into where the potentially challenging sections are. Um, but, um, but yeah, let me talk about what the agenda is. So I'm going to let's see, let's see if I can hide this out of the way. I wonder if that's as good as I can get it. Okay. So, um, I have to work with it. No. okay. Um, so the, um, I'm going to talk about what BOS is, what is the BOS Open Data Service. Um, I'm going to talk about how you access the data as a consumer and what the different options are for doing so. Um, I'm also going to talk about um, a bit about why the profile was created. Um, and um, as part of this, then I'll talk about what the principles are of the document. I'm not the author of the document, that's uh, Stuart Reynolds, um, but uh, um, um, but I'm, I'm going to try and give as much information as I can about this. So I'm going to try and highlight the overriding principles, the document concepts. I think there's some useful types of information that, that is um, um, displayed in certain ways. So I'm going to highlight those. Then I'm going to spend some time looking at all the contents of the, of the uh, profile and highlight the mandatory elements. And then I want to focus on just a couple of points which I think are important to understand. So that's um, how to find a service um, that is valid for a particular day. Um, and also I'm going to talk about matching between the different data types that will be on BODS as well. So um, I hope that um, you can see this okay. My GoSu meeting controls are a little bit um, in the way for me, but hopefully it's not in the way for you. Okay, so um, the data types that are provided. I, we, we have three data types that are published to, to BODS, timetables data, bus location data, and fares data. And um, yeah, each of these have their own standards. Each of these are aligned so that the industry follows the same standard when publishing this data. So how do you consume? So it'd be, anyone can do this now. It's it's open and it's available. You can uh, jump onto BODS and you can be downloading data in just a few minutes. Um, you'll need to register to use the API, but you don't need to register to just download um, files or use the download all function. So you can use the browse function, browse for specific data to search for maybe an operator that you're interested in or a region that you're interested in. And you can see the results that are displayed and you can you can download the, uh, the XML files. You can click through to the results and then you'll see a visualization of that file and then you, can, you should find the link to download that file. Um, or you can just download everything in a, in a big zip. Um, or you can use the a API to um, query in a similar way that you can use with the user interface, but you can use the query parameters to, um, to automate your process of finding data that you're interested in. The um, transit exchange files won't be supplied in the response. You'll receive links to the transit exchange files in the response. So why does the profile exist? Um, there are um, two main um, um, reasons. So I've pulled these out of the out of the spec. So um, with TransExchange, um, it's it's a complicated, flexible um, um, design, um, standard which has been used in different ways by different um, um, organisations in the past. Um, and it's whilst it's um, straightforward for a, an organisation to decide how to create this, um, someone that's reading this needs to understand all the different ways that. Um, that these can be created. So um, you need to understand all the different, in the past you'd need to understand all the different quirks and, and ways of doing things that operators use um, before you can make sure that you understand the data fully. Um, so um, the profile aims to bring this all into line. Um, so um, it should avoid hiding simple data in complex constructs. Um, and also it would um, specify consistent use of the elements and overall, aim uh, to achieve a higher quality. Um, so that can mean that we're all doing it in a consistent way, in the same way, um, and that helps us to ensure that we're all doing it in the, in the correct way. So the overriding principles that, that apply in the profile, so um, it's, um, it reuses um, a lot of data. Um, so data should be stated once and in the right place. Um, 
Um, and uh, data should be stated unambiguously, so there's correct element use. I'll talk about a, a bit about that shortly. And ID should be provided. So um, IDs, so a line can have an ID, uh, and this information can be um, 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 used to identify when a transit exchange file has a new version uh, or new information for that line. You can you can use the version control along with the line ID to understand whether the um, um, the data has changed. Um, so the IDs and and the reuse of these um, uh, and the joining of these in the data mean that you have um, um, modular um, data that that can be um, reused. So you don't repeat the same information throughout the file. So the document concepts. I think that um, Stuart's done a good job of describing um, what's mandatory and what's optional. And it's important to describe that what's optional is recommended, but it's not it's not mandatory. Um, and it's also useful to explain a concept. In an, op in an optional section, um, there might be, if you do use it, then you need to, there will be mandatory elements that you have to use. Um, so that's something that's worth, uh, worth um, highlighting, that um, there is, um, um, going to be um, a, a, a need to sometimes identify whether you want to supply something that's optional, and if you do, you need to make sure that you supply within that everything that would be mandatory if you do supply that. Um, so I think that that's and it uses these these visualizations, the uh, the red and the and the amber to show whether it's mandatory or optional. Another useful um, piece of content in the in the profile is these permitted element tables. So I've just done a, 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 sn a snippet here, but um, this is just a, an example of, of, of something for serviced organizations, but it shows um, for each of the elements for a serviced organization, um, whether it's um, um, essential for the profile, whether, um, and also gives information about whether it's also mandated by the schema here, you can see. So this table is throughout the document, and you can see this element by element description of whether it's mandatory, whether it's optional, um, and, and whether it's used at all. Um, and so this, this breakdown is really helpful. Okay, so in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about what's mandatory in each section, um, and I'm going to use this this concept, so this this layout. So um, a quick overview of what each section is. So there's there's about ten sections in the document. I'm not going to try and cover overall exactly what transit exchange is and does. Um, this this session is about the profile, but there is information about the schema that, that is available online. I know the last session that was done by Tim as well um, covered um, the, the schema really well, um, but I'll try and there will be some overlap inevitably. So I'll just talk about the way that the, um, um, the document is laid out and what's mandatory for each of these, and I'll highlight some, some important optional parts as well. So in the general section of the document, it describes two things really, version control and accessibility. So version control is very important. So I'm, I'm, I've got a slide later that, that talks about this, um, but this is something that's going to be very important for a consumer of a file to understand what is the appropriate um, 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 file to use. So it'd be a version control. So you'll be able to see what is the most up-to-date information. Um, and you can use that along with um, validity periods to find out what's, what's appropriate for a given day. So, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. Um, accessibility is optional, um, but recommended. If you do provide accessibility information, there's a couple of things that you need to supply. You need to supply um, whether the vehicle is wheelchair accessible, and there's a couple of other things that you need to describe as well. Um, but yeah, this is just a good example of where accessibility is optional, but if you do provide any accessible information, you need to provide the vehicle type, um, and it should, it should have this wheel, wheelchair accessible flag. To see whether it is wheelchair accessible or not. Okay, so serviced organisations uh, describes how um, timetables can change during term time. Um, it's optional uh, but recommended. So, and if you do use it, um, then um, you need to state unambiguously um, when they um, when they when they operate. Um, I suppose we're there. So. Um, um, but if they're not used, then you can use normal date records um, elsewhere. Um, and also, um, the service organisation, the I, there is some challenges when it comes to service organisation. Not all schools have a code which is known and centrally and can be understood centrally by everybody. Not all schools have, have a code allocated to them. And if they don't, um, then it's important to be consistent with the code that you do use for that school. Um,
operators, garages and registrations. So this is not the registration profile. Um, um, the registrations group of information is not included in, in the uh, in, in the transit exchange that goes to BOTS. Um, but what we do need is the National Operator Code, short name, trading name, license number, um, and garages as appropriate. Um, and so the, this, this section is really just about who is the operator. Services and lines, this is an important concept, um, something that is highlighted, um, it's not my highlighting. Um, so the services group should only contain a single service element. Now, transit exchange is more flexible than this. Um, transit exchange, the schema will allow you to to include lots of lots of services in the file, but the profile says that this should not be done. And the aim is there to um, to reduce um, complexity in a file and and remove problems in the file. It's also um, important to highlight that you shouldn't have different versions of the same service. So if you've got um, a, a service description which is valid now and another service that and changes to that service which will come in effect in the future you need to put those in two different transit exchange files you can't put them in the same uh, transit exchange file and if, you, if you're an operator that runs multiple services as, as all of them do um, you need to create one transit exchange file for each service that you do it's important to highlight though that the lines is um, um, a concept that will mean that you can describe all of the variants of that service using the lines group so the one and one A um, can be um, in, in included in, in, in the inbound and the outbound versions of these can be included in, in the single um, in, in a single transit exchange. You don't need to create one for each line. Stop points and stop areas. Um, so your stop can, can be a NAPTAN code or the data you'd want in NAPTAN, but only really in exceptional circumstances. Um, areas um, so groups of stops are not to be um, included in the in in transit exchange files sent to bods so um i'll just talk about briefly the types of circumstances that you wouldn't use your naptan codes so these would be um festivals or other um temporary kind of arrangements where a stop might not be there um forever um and you might not expect the stop to be added to naptan in that case but you want to run a service to it you can add the stop point um, element um, and use, and you'd need to add all of the um, information that would normally be in NAPTAN. Um, so um, the, uh, the document here doesn't describe it, there's a NAPTAN spec for that, but, um, but yeah, the, the information that you would expect in NAPTAN needs to be just supplied in the, in the transit exchange file, if, uh, if not using the NAPTAN code. Routes and tracks. Um, so um, routes are um, um, mandatory um, and uh, you have uh, routes and route sections and links to journey patterns. Um, tracks are also uh, recommended. Um, tracks are particularly useful for describing the road so that um, if you're looking at the, the, uh, the route, you can understand exactly what the nature of that road is uh, so that real-time systems don't assume that it's a, it's a straight line from one point on your route to the next. It can use the track information to identify whether there's a, you know, a big roundabout or a big turn um, um, that's, that can help somebody do better predictions uh, if the route information is there, sorry, if the track information is there. Um, so yeah, just to highlight here that um, in your route, um, 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 path, you need the route root section, which is mandatory, um, and route links. Um, and it's um, um, important that route sections are logically structured to fac facilitate reuse within routes to help minimize file sizes. So um, journey timings, these are journey, journey patterns. Uh, these, these apply to standard services, not flexible services. Um, so uh, a standard service is where you've got a time, uh, you know, a route and a timetable that goes along it, and a, a flexible service I'll touch on later. But there's no timings for a flexible service. There, there, book it um, and go and 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 so, um, yeah. Journey patterns here apply to standard services, and these will join up with your route information. So your routes or your route sections, um, and so yeah. Description here: what's mandatory? Um, there should be at least one journey pattern for your inbound and one for your outbound, um, and these should have a one-to-one -one mapping to your route and sub elements. Vehicle journeys. So this brings everything together that's been described previously in the document. So a vehicle journey shall have a vehicle journey code, a service ref and a line ref. So these three pieces are really important for joining with, with Siri VM. 
your vehicle journey code um, is a is an ID that can be used to describe your um, um, the uh, the journey uh, that the bus is on. So it will talk about um, the, the following bullet. So you'll have a destination display. It will show where that journey is going. Um, it'll have a journey pattern ref, um, which we talked about earlier, um, and um, uh, or it can reference another vehicle journey. Um, so you can have these nested. Um, you can have a, a vehicle journey that references another vehicle journey, which in turn needs to have all of its uh, information. Um, and you need to have your departure time or define them as a frequency, uh, a frequent journey using frequency information. Um, so using this, this information, you can see exactly what journey the vehicle is on. Um, and yeah, this will define the operation of the trip. Um, optionally, overriding some of the information that we talked about earlier, as long as you do a complete replacement. Um, um, so, um, and also another important point for vehicle journeys is departure day shift. Um, so, the profile describes how to use journeys and trips that go over midnight and how you should use um, operational days and calendar days to describe this. So, hopefully, it should remove any uncertainty about, about journeys that go from one day to the next. Flexible services. Um, so, um, the flexible service is um, um, if, is is a mandatory element. Uh, it should have a flexible journey pattern, um, and uh, and the flexible journey pattern shall consist of a set of stopping points and information about how you book it. So that's about it for a flexible for a flexible service. Um, it's a it's a set of points or areas of points and. Uh, um, and uh, and if so, maybe you can book it online, or maybe you can book it with your mobile, or text, or or in person. So um, it, that information needs to be supplied. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit more about version control. Um, and the version control is something which has been uh, a topic for all sorts of um, people that uh, that I'm engaging with. So operators, local authorities, and consumers and suppliers are all having to get used to how this works and so I've, I've, just, I've put together a couple of slides to try and uh, describe this um, and before I go into the next slide I'm just going to I've created a scenario that I want to talk through so the scenario is that an operator starts a new service and the transit exchange file is created and published in, in a zip file on the 1st of November so this means that on the 1st of November they sat at their machine opened up their scheduling software and they exported the file um, and they published it to BODS, but this, this file um, is, is for a service that is valid from the 1st of December 2020. Um, so um, it's, it's, they've put, supplied it to BODS in advance of that service taking effect. So the operating period shows that the, uh, the, the, the service will, the, will start from the 1st of December. So the next step on this scenario is that on the 15th of December, the operator again sits on the machine. They they decide that they need to export a new transit exchange, so they need to create a new transit exchange file for the service because of changes for the Christmas period. Um, so this Christmas period is from the 20th of December to the 31st of December. So on the on the 15th, they have gone ahead and exported that file, published it to BODS, um, and they've um, they've added that file to the services.zip. So this zip file that they published to BODS now contains two files in it, um, two transit exchange files for the same service. One that um, they originally published on the 1st of November and one that they um, updated it with on the 15th of December. So when somebody downloads this zip file for this operator, they're going to see two transit exchange files in there for the same service. Um, and, uh, and so the operator will want from the 1st of January onwards for the, um, for the original file to be valid. Um, and it's for that Christmas period that the that the that the second file is valid. So let me show you that visualized here. So um, we've got two files. Um, so the first file, they're both for service one. The first file is um, 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 it's, it's got some key information here. So I've described the version control information and also the operating period information. So you can see that that row across the top is um, that file that's that's got a validity period that is the start date of the 1st of December and it has no end date. So it's it's intended to be their timetable that runs on and on. Um, and uh, and so this, um, if it was on its own, 
if this was the only transit change file that was there, this is the file that you would use um, going forward uh, from the 1st of December onwards. And I just want to talk about the version control information that's there. So you can see the creation date, it's the 1st of November 2020. So that's the date that the, uh, the operator sat down and exported this file. And when they exported it, it was given this information. Modification date is null, it, um, revision number zero, and modification new. So this shows that um, um, it's it's the it's the fresh first version of this of this um, transit change file for this service. And then um, you can see the second file there. It has slightly different information in it. It's got a creation date of first of November 2020. So note that that's the same as the original one. That's um, because that when you're updating a transit change file for a service, the creation date does not change. That always stays the same. Um, um, the um, um, no matter how many times they change and re-export their transit exchange files for this service, it will always show the, the original creation date of 1st of November 2020. But this one has a modification date of the 15th of December. So this means that they um, they sat at their machine on the 15th of December and they exported it at that point. And when they exported it, it became uh, this transit exchange file uh, was allocated a revision number of one and a modification state of revised. So um, the revision number is important here, but the operating period is also very important. So you can see that you've got a start date for this transit change file of the 20th of December and an end date of the 31st of December. So this file is intended to be valid between the 20th of October, uh, sorry, the 20th of December and the 31st of December. Um, but the reason why I'm explaining this is because uh, there is a conflict. So as a consumer, you've downloaded the zip file, you're interested in what's, what timetable data should I present to my users or what, sh what should I understand for analysis purposes is the correct data for the 26th of December, for example. So I can see um, the first thing that normally you'd look at is the um, start date and end dates, the operating periods. So I can see one's got a start date of the 1st of December onwards, so yeah, that's valid for the 26th of December. But also the other one has got a start date 20th until the 31st, at the end date of the 31st, that's also valid for the 26th. So what I need to do, if I've got a conflict on my operating periods, I need to fall back to the versioning so, so that I can see um, what else can tell me which transit change file for this service is valid. So I will be able to see that um, the um, both of them have um, both of them are uh, have an operating period that's valid for the 26th of December, for example. But I can but so I need to then okay look at what's the highest revision number, um, and that's revision number one. Now it could be I've shown an example here with just two files for an operating period. There could be three or four files for an individual uh, day or an operating period, and you simply need to see which will down all of the trans trans exchange files that are in the zip. For the service that you're interested in, which will down from there all of the transit exchange files that are valid for the operating period that you're interested in, and from there look at which one has the highest revision number, and that is the one that is valid for the, for any particular day. And you can see, if you take yourselves um, to the 5th of January, you now need to look at what files have we got. So I've got two files for this service. Uh, which files are valid for the, have an operating period for the 5th of January? Only one of them. Um, so I can see that the original file is valid for the 5th of January, and it's that file that I would use um, uh, for that for that period of time. I don't need to use this this other file because the operating period has an end date of 31st of December. So on the 5th of January, I um, um, I know that um, there's only one file that's available to me with an operating period that I'm interested in. There'll be chances for questions at the end, so uh, I'll be interested in any any challenges or concerns about this. Just a brief note on this. I've described here the version control that um, um, is is present at, at multiple points in the document. Um, you have version control at the um, transit exchange level of the document, but it's also available for the line um, or the service or, or other elements of the of the transit exchange. So um, it's important to explain that um, you should be able to see in a file um, uh, what has changed. Uh, whether a line has changed or whether other uh, items have changed in from one from one um, um, version of the transit exchange to the next. Okay, I'm, this is the last slide, then we're going to get to questions. So I'm going to um, talk about matching data. So um, I've 
talked about um, um, the operator section. So the middle middle column you can see is the transit's changed. So the national operator code you would expect to be in there. Um, this should join up with the operator ref in Siri VM. And also in NetEx, you should see the operator ref in there too. So you can use the national operator code to make sure that you're looking at data for the right operator. Um, but for Siri VM, you'd be, interest, you'd be interested in looking at what, what journey is that bus on at that point in time, and you can see their location. So you can see other pieces of information to find out um, um, where this bus is going. So um, block ref is going to be very important. Um, so you can see uh, block ref will align with block number in the transit change. Um, the uh, block number will be in the um, in the vehicle journey information. Um, as well as the, um, um, the block in there, you've also got the vehicle journey code. So in Siri VM, it's vehicle journey ref. So uh, vehicle journey ref aligns with vehicle journey code in the transit exchange. Um, and uh, as we talked about earlier, vehicle journey code is, is the ID that describes um, the, um, the, uh, the journey that the uh, vehicle is on. So this can be uh, one that departs at a certain time on a certain line. Um, and, and so the construct of this is, is flexible, but there needs to be enough information to, to find um, um, the, uh, the journey that you're interested in. Um, the important um, um, data points that are, that are used is destination ref and origin ref. These can help you zero in on information to confirm that your bus is, um, um, so this, the destination ref aligns directly with the stop point ref in the transit change um, that will be the, the last stop on that on that um, journey and so you can you can make sure that the destination ref aligns with this with the last stop point on that journey on your transit exchange file and same with the origin ref so you should be able to use all of these information points to to give you confidence that you are looking at the um, at the right data to confirm what journey that bus is on okay um, so if you have any questions about the the service or um, or the profile, you can get in touch with the with the BODS team here, and I'll make sure that you um, you get the response that you need, um, and um, you can call me directly. So I know that there'll be lots of questions about this, and um, it'd be great to answer them here so everyone can see the answers. If I don't have the answer, I'll take it away and see if I can get that for you. Um, um, but yeah, um, that's it, Tim. I'm open to questions at this point. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, that was uh, very helpful and uh, and covered. Uh, some of the uh, the burning issue topics that uh, I know you've been dealing with and uh, people have been asking me. So we've had a couple of um, questions, um, some of which have been answered in the chat already. Um, one thing um, that's outstanding um, is about non-NAPTAN stat stops and when they can be used um, because the profile document says that um, the, the cases that you can use them for will be in legislation and guidance, but it's not in the current published version of the um, BODS guidance um, that's on yeah. the website. So we just need to uh, to review that and make sure that there's an update to that. But I know one is in the offing anyway. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I think that yeah, there's a couple of examples supplied, so festivals and temporary locations. But yeah, um, I think we need to provide something which is a, a bit more certain. Um, yeah, and a list that people can refer to. Yeah, um, and um, there's been a question about licensing um, of track data in Trans Exchange, um, and whether there's a there's a mapping license. Um, issue with uh, Ordnance Survey and uh, uh, OpenStreetMap. Um, so uh, OpenStreetMap, I don't think should be a problem because it's the this data is being made open, um, and that's one of the things that uh, they don't like is if you then use it for 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 private commercial um, use. Ordnance Survey though. Um, is probably worth having a um, a dis discussion with them at a at a DFT type level um, to make sure that um, they're okay with it. Um, a few years ago, when I had discussions with Ordnance Survey, 
um, about use of tracks. Um, they were in the process of resolving that issue, so I don't know whether they actually did or not. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to add on that. Um, um, but but yeah, being open is, I think, probably going to be the leading principle. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, we, I think that I'd be happy to facilitate those discussions um, if, if we need to. So I'm not aware of any issue, licensing issues on this point. Um, cause yeah, they're, they're, I'll, yeah, I'll talk to you offline about that, and we'll uh, we'll get something issued to people. Um, are there any more questions people have got? I can't believe that's it. Looks like there's another one there from Peter, if uh -huh. I've just seen. Yeah. So yeah, I'll just go back to the uh, to the slide for service dogs. Um, so you don't need to use service organisations in in your in your transit exchange, but if you do, then you need to supply um, the right types of um, complementary data for that. Um, so um, so yeah. Hopefully that answers your question, Peter. Then we've got another one from uh, from Vladimir, uh, who will be responsible for data integrity, correct sequence of versions, lack of conflicts, etc. Well, yeah, it's going to be, I think, um, the operator. The operator are responsible for publishing their data, and um, the operator can allocate an agent, um, but it's not something the operator really should to worry about. I expect that the software that they use to generate and export their new versions of the transit exchange, it should just work in the background. So um, whenever they create a new a new export, a new version of this, um, there will be um, increments in the revision uh, number. Um, and they will need, the operator will need to make sure that they get their operating periods right. Um, but I've talked to the big five in detail and other operators about how to do this um, and how they can utilize the, the functionality. So um, I think that it will make it a little bit easier for operators rather than um, publishing a never ending sequence of updated files. They can have um, just a set of files that are uh, valid for individual periods of time um, and uh, uh, and it should make it a little bit easier for them to um, um, to to supply um, trans exchange files, um, but yeah, they need to make sure they get it right. Uh, the obligation is on is on them. Um, but I will be supporting them uh, through that process uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and consumers, I'm also making sure are able to understand this information as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wilfred um, asks, um, are vehicle block data included in the profile? It's not mandatory. We wanted to, but I don't think it's um, possible for all operators to supply um, block data. Um, not all operators use, use scheduling software, but um, it's certainly recommended and it's going to be really helpful. So I'm talking to as many operators as, as I can to make sure that they understand this and supply this where they can. Um, but it's, 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 it's recommended, but not mandatory. Okay. Um... David did asks about version control and whether and the complexity of systems consuming it. Um, yeah. would it so I'll, be... I'll, I'll tackle this, and I think that um, there is two there's two points to consider. You have pretty much you've, the important thing is your revision number and your operating period. So in the past, I know that Traveline worked by just supplying um, um, data, and you could you could understand what is the most appropriate data to use by seeing which one has the most recent start date. And the exact in the example I supplied, you could use that logic as well, and it would help you reach the same conclusion. Um, but there's two two cases that um, that is improved by by the profile. So um, let me just click here. So in the example here, um, if you're just going to use the most recent start date, then you can see here that um, the, the second file has a more recent start date. So yeah, you can use that um, 
for the operating period it's interested in. But then there might be some uncertainty about the 1st of January onwards, because the, the file has an end date of 31st of December, but it's got the most recent start date. So um, with the previous um, view of the world, you would say, well, I haven't got any data. Uh, but here you can see that using the revision number, the highest revision number for an operating period, you can see that you need to fall back to the, to the original file. A second case where it can help is if more than one file is supplied with the same start date. So this does happen rarely, but it does, but it does happen. Operators are not perfect in the way that they supply their data. If they do supply two transit exchange files with the same start date, then you need to know which one's correct. Um, and if you don't have the version control information, then you can't see that. So the version control information should be able to see, enable you to see which one was modified most recently, which one has the higher revision number, and that should help you understand which is the appropriate file to use in that case. So it, it is a bit more complicated, but it's not super complicated. You've got two concepts. You've got the operating period and the revision number. Um, and using that, you should be able to see for any, any day what is the highest revision number. OK. Um, question about whether the FT is still looking um, for um, publishing of data at the start of 2021 with lockdowns and COVID taking place and, and that sort of thing. There's no change um, so far. Um, the policy team are looking at this, and I think that you'd be always welcome to to contact the the DFT policy team, and I can I can facil facilitate that. So if you would like to um, send some information then, uh, or request some information, then then you can do so. But I'm not aware of any changes that are in play. Yeah. Um, question about the PTI profile, and if it if you supply a file with a registration blocking whether it will be accepted um or whether it will be rejected um that's if, if you're going to supply a registration block then you're going to be using the registration schema um the pti profile will be validated against the general trans exchange schema so um you will get an error um if you try and supply a registration schema file um uh track data is not yep. mandatory mike um it's optional because not everybody can supply it um yep. uh question from sonia about versions of trans exchange got an open date will it automatically end date when a new file is is loaded up so yeah it it won't bots won't edit the trans exchange files um so what you what you need to do in that case is you need to look at um so an operator has two options normally an operator would just have a zip, a zip file for their services and they would just add um a a new file um with a higher revision number in there so in the question uh, if a new version of the trans exchange is loaded with an open end date. So in my example here, you've got the 1st of um, December start date, but open ended end date. If they wanted to publish a change to this service that takes effect from, say, the 1st of February 21, um, they can do so. And um, there will be um, a higher re revision number on that new file that they supply. They don't need to do anything physically to the original file. They can leave that in the zip file if they want to. Um, they can declutter it by removing it at a certain point in the future, but it should be that uh, when, a, when a consumer is looking at that zip and they can see for this file they've got uh, for this uh, service they've got two files one with the start date of the 1st of December onwards and one with the start of date of 1st of February onwards they can say okay I've got two files for a, an operating period that, that are covering it I need to look at which one's got the higher revision number and they would use that to identify which one is the appropriate file to use yeah okay um, and does the bus services act replace paper registrations uh, no it doesn't um, it's just a uh, a new obligation to to make the data open through the bod service um, ian asks about version looking at the basic timetable it's seven different trans exchange files for christmas will EBSR accept the Trans Exchange UK profile. Um, 
that last bit, Ian, no, it won't. Uh, EBSR um, requires the registration schema validation. Um, so the two are mutually exclusive from that point of view. Um, but um, the Christmas complexity, uh, I'll let Ben. Yeah. So, yeah, for the purposes of this um, of this deck, I've just provided a simple example, but you're absolutely right. I think we are looking at seven um, files as being the potential that you could supply for the next 42 days ahead. Um, so um, as, a, as an operator, you need to supply data for what's valid now and what's valid in the future. And yeah, it could well be that, um, that as you are um, looking at supplying data for the period ahead of 42 days, you can... Um, um, you can supply lots of versions for with um, uh, for trying to exchange files that are valid for any particular period of time, and that might be not just for Christmas. It might be for uh, maybe um, maybe a bridge is being worked on, so there needs to be reroute around it. Maybe there's some gas works. Um, uh, in some of these cases, you will know how long the work is expected to take, so you can end date that that temporary uh, trans exchange file. Um, but if you don't know how how long it's going to take, you can um, you can end, you can end date you can leave the end date open for your for your temporary file but but it should give the operator the flexibility to um to describe what they expect to be real for any particular calendar day um and so yeah um i think that we'll we'll need to use um um the uh the, you know the time going forward to make sure that we um uh, um that everyone understands this but but yeah it should be that um yeah some cases are pretty complex and like i say you can have maybe three or four or seven files which are um valid for an individual day within an operating period but it's simple you just look at the highest revision number and whichever file has the highest revision number for any particular day that's the one that you you know is 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 the one to use Okay, um, and the last question before we end uh, from Mike, if a new file is uploaded with an error, can it be removed or does a new file need to be uploaded to override it? So there's some validation um, um, processes that happen when you do upload your file. There's a data quality report that's done. So if your file is meeting the schema and, uh, and it's valid trans exchange file, it'll be, it'll be data quality checked. Um, if there's a problem with that, it won't be uploaded. So um, it will go in, maybe into your drafts, um, um, but it won't be published until you decide to publish it. Um, so if there's a problem with your upload, there'll be a button that says, try again, upload a new, a new updated file or a new link, and, and you can do so. Yeah. Okay. Um, Actually, can sorry, can I, can I just say, uh, I meant one that is syntactically correct, but the meaning in it is it in it is wrong. Oh, thanks. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So if you've if you've uploaded it and you've published it, and maybe you notice yourself, or maybe someone gives you some feedback, there is an update button. You can click on it to update it, uh, and that will mean that you can replace that zip file with a new zip file that contains a corrected um, trans exchange file. So in that zip, you can decide what is in that zip file, um, and you can you can edit your zip file and republish it um, so that it, it replaces what was there originally. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, thank you for um, answering um, all of the, uh, the, the questions. Um, we're running out of time, trying to make sure we finish at, uh, at one. Um, so, Thank you for joining us today. Um, we've got some more sessions in our data standards um, series coming up. Um, NetX tomorrow, um, GTFS and, uh, and IPXPT uh, at the start of December. Um, please uh, join us. If you're not an Artig member, then um, get in touch and we can uh, and work out how you can uh, join us and find out about those as well as getting access to uh to, to the previous sessions we've had on uh, on naptan trans exchange siri and and the other standards that are uh, actively in use in the uk um so um thank you for um joining us this afternoon thank you to ben particularly for um talking us through the uh, the profile and answering the uh, the questions um, if you want to know more about um, Artig and what we uh, do, 
then uh, my details are, uh, are here. And we'll make the, the slides and the recording available uh, in the next couple of days and send those of you that have joined us today uh, an email with the links to those. So thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon um, and hope you have a good rest of the day and stay safe. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you.